Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're gonna take a look at elbow flexion and talk about it in regards to the bicep curl, also known as the arm curl. Now, first thing is, when we talk about the arm curl or bicep curl, we're referring to flexion at the elbow. Now, you can have your wrist or forearm in different positions. You can have a supinated position. How do I remember that? If you want some soup, you create that position. So this is supinated, this is neutral, this is pronated. You can do the curl in any one of these three wrist positions and I'm gonna talk about what muscles get activated depending on what wrist position. The other thing is thinking about where your elbow is. We're gonna talk about the neutral or relaxed point elbow position, so elbow in here. Same with the shoulder. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about shoulder flexion briefly with the bicep brachii. Three muscles you need to be aware of when it comes to elbow flexion or the bicep curl. First is the muscle that takes up the majority of the volume. This is going to be the biceps brachii, all right? Just generally called the biceps. Now you can see the biceps brachii here creates about 50% of the volume of this upper brachii at the front anterior aspect. And what you're gonna find is it has two heads. That's what's called the biceps brachii, two. You can see that there's a short head and a long head. Now the long head has its origins here, the supraglenoid fossa at the glenohumeral joint. So it basically attaches in where the ball attaches into the scapula. And that's the long head. You can have the short head attaching in at the coracoid process. They come together to form a single belly and you're gonna find at the distal end where it inserts, one tendon is gonna insert at the tuberosity of the radius. And what you're gonna find is that another portion of this tendon turns into something that's basically like a flat tendon-like sheath that we call an aponeuroses. This is gonna be called the bicipital aponeuroses. And what's important about this is that the bicipital aponeuroses covers the flexors of the forearm. And this is important because when we look at bicep curls, at least talking about the biceps brachii, is that when we're in a supinated position, this aponeuroses is taut. It's tight. If we go into a pronated position, it's in a disadvantaged position to pull on the biceps brachii. We'll talk about that shortly. All right, as we move across, let's talk about the brachialis. That's the next muscle you need to know. Now, the brachialis is the deepest of the three flexors. It's actually relatively hard to pick up on an EC, uh, EMG, I should say. But what you're gonna find is that for the brachialis, its origin is gonna be about two thirds down the humerus at the anterior portion, and it inserts at the ulnar tuberosity right here. Now the brachialis, this is how I want you to remember it. Regardless of hand position for a curl, regardless of whether there's a resistive force or not, you're gonna activate the brachialis. So when we talk about bicep curl, and what's getting activated and what's not being activated at particular portions, angles, and pronated, supinated positions of the wrist, what you're gonna find is that brachialis is gonna be activated at all times. All right, brachioradialis. Brachioradialis is another superficial muscle. Biceps is superficial, brachioradialis is superficial. You can find that its origin is gonna be at the distal portion of the humerus. Its insertion is gonna be at the distal portion of the radius. Now the brachioradialis, you probably often hear as being the muscle that's going to be activated in pronated curls. Now that has some truth to it, but also not the whole story, but we'll talk about that. All right, they're the three muscles you must know. They all play a role in elbow flexion. Now another point, biceps play an important role in supination. Supination, and this is important not necessarily when it's at full extension, but at 90 degrees, it plays a very important supination role. That's biceps. Also, because of where it's attached at the scapula, it plays a role in shoulder flexion. Now, only the initial portion of shoulder flexion, otherwise, if you go too far, you're gonna be activating the anterior delts and a bit of the pec, right? So, we're gonna talk about bicep curls. When we talk about bicep curls, we're talking about the arm beginning at full extension, the elbow not moving. All right, that means if the elbow was to move, there's gonna be particular flexion. Now the first thing is, a lot of people probably tell you if you're doing bicep curls, you need to keep that elbow tucked so that you're just doing elbow flexion. Now that's true, you will be activating all three muscles, but remember, the biceps play a minor role in shoulder flexion. So if there is a little bit of shoulder flexion, it's not necessarily a bad thing because you're still working the biceps brachii. However, you are, if you have this exaggerated too much, you're gonna be activating anterior delts and pecs. So this is the reason why they say keep that elbow tucked in. Now, when we look at, let's start off with the supinated position with the arm curl, all right? So what you're gonna find is, when you start with a supinated position for an arm curl, all three muscles 
are actually gonna be activated in this process, all right? And what you're gonna find is that at 55 degrees, which is around about this position, so this is 90 degrees, this is about 55 degrees, this is the strongest position to activate biceps brachii and brachioradialis, okay? Now remember, brachialis is activated at all times. So just leave that one in the background, always working. Let's talk about these two being activated. They're both gonna be activated maximally at 55 degrees. However, the position of the wrist and forearm is gonna play a role as to which one's going to be taking most of that particular load. Now, when we start at the supinated position, all three are gonna be activated. 55 degrees is the strongest position all the way up. Now, as you go, the more contracted you're going to be, the more you're going to pull in brachioradialis, okay? So, brachioradialis. Other thing about brachioradialis is because it's down at the radius, what you're gonna find is if you wanna see that muscle, put your hand in a neutral position and tense against that hand. This muscle that comes up here, that's the brachioradialis. And you can see it in the neutral position. People think that you only activate the brachioradialis in the neutral or the pronated position, but that's not necessarily true. Brachioradialis is active, actually most active in the supinated position. However, when you're in the pronated position, because of the bicipital aponeuroses covering the flexors of the forearm, when you pronate, because of its position, it puts the bicep brachii at a disadvantaged position to be able to maximally activate for a curl. So what that means is brachioradialis has to carry that load. And when it does, people think biceps have turned off, brachioradialis has turned on, not true. Brachioradialis has stayed on, it's just proportionally it's now increased because biceps has dropped down. Now this is the thing with the pronated curl. Up until 110 degrees, right, the biceps are gonna be pretty poor in this position. Still gonna be working, but pretty poor. But once it's at 110 degrees, the biceps brachii doesn't matter whether it's pronated, neutral, or supinated, it's still gonna be maximally working, all right? So up until a point. So what's the take home message so far? Supinated does all three. Pronated does brachioradialis predominantly up until 110 degrees, then bicep brachii kicks back in, all right? Brachialis is gonna be active the whole time. And what about the neutral position? Well, it seems to be the neutral position is one of the most powerful positions to activate all three muscle groups. Again, I'm just talking about the concentric phase of this movement. I haven't spoken about the eccentric phase. Now, when we look at the eccentric phase, here's an interesting point. Concentrically, all three are activated. Eccentrically, what you're gonna find is brachioradialis is minimally activated and biceps brachii is maximally activated. So a lot of people, if they'd like to isolate the biceps brachii, now you're not truly isolating it because you will be using these other muscles, but if you want to more so isolate bicep brachii, then the eccentric portion of the movement. Another thing is the speed of the curl. If you curl slowly, you have less activation of brachioradialis. If you curl quickly, what you're gonna find, you can see this, when you do a, a quick curl against resistance, right, more forcefully, everything kicks in. So the faster the curl against a heavier weight, the more the three muscles are gonna kick in rapidly. The slower the curl, you're probably gonna find less brachioradialis, more brachialis and bicep brachii, all right? Now, what about the different types of curls you can do in regards to the bars that you use. So you can have an easy bar which or a W bar because it's of that position. In an easy bar, you hold it in a semi-prone or semi-neutral position. A, dumb, uh, a dumbbell curl, so that's gonna be the, a free weight, or the straight bar or the barbell curl. What the studies have demonstrated is this. If you want to maximally activate your three flexors, it seems to be that of these three, the easy bar in that semi-prone position maximally activates bicep brachii and brachioradialis more so than in the dumbbell curl. Now in the dumbbell curl, what this study showed was you began at the neutral position and then once you hit 90 degrees, went into the supinated position. Still seemed to be that the easy bar maximally activated the muscles more so than the dumbbell curl and pure supinated barbell curl. So, this is a quick run through of the functional anatomy 
of the bicep curl.